This episode is brought to you by Groove Washer, the best record cleaners and protective sleeves for your vinyl collection. Ask for the Groove Washer from your local shop or go to GrooveWasher.com. Discount code VinylGuide10. And now, on with the show. Well, hello everyone, it's Nate. Welcome to episode 422 of The Vinyl Guide, the podcast for record collectors and music nerds. And today we are speaking with Jack McEwen of the band Psychedelic Porn Crumpets. Now, I know that's quite a lot to unpack just in the name, but let me tell you, Psychedelic Porn Crumpets is an amazing band out of Perth, Australia. They make some gorgeous vinyl records and some killer music imprinted on them. Now, today Jack and I discuss all sorts of rare records from the band, the early and super collectible vinyl copies of High Visceral Parts 1 and 2. We talk about whether we'll get reissues of these albums, the psychedelic porn crumpets process for making records, the origin, challenges, and benefits of the name of the band, as well as the new psychedelic porn crumpets LP, Franzoli, which is officially out November 10th. Grab a vinyl copy at psychedelicporncrumpets.bandcamp.com. And there's a few other albums out there besides Franzoli. I think there's still some Night Gnomes available and some other merch. But really, I urge you, go there now. Because first pressing Psychedelic Porn Crumpets records tend to become very collectible. Again, that's psychedelicporncrumpets.bandcamp.com or (laughs) psychedelicporncrumpets.com. And hey, let's level with each other. You love records. I love records. Let's all love vinyl records together, shall we? And all you got to do is follow the Vinyl Guide podcast for free in your podcast app. Generally, there's a little follow button or a plus sign if you're in Spotify. Just follow the Vinyl Guide podcast and you will get access to hundreds of interviews and vinyl record talk with the likes of Justin Chancellor of Tool, episode 417. Comedian, actor, and podcast pioneer Mark Marin talks vinyl records, episode 400. Chris Shiflett of Foo Fighters, episode 382. Ben Blackwell of Third Man Records, episode 374. Ambrose Kenny Smith of King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, as well as the Murlocs, episode 325. John Dwyer of the Mighty OCs and Castleface Records, episode 331. And literally hundreds more, all free to enjoy anytime just by following the Vinyl Guide podcast. All right, without further delay, peoples, let's get into it. Here is Jack McEwen of Psychedelic Porn Crumpets. This week on the Vinyl Guide, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jack McEwen of the Psychedelic Porn Crumpets, who's uh, got a brand new album, Franzoli, out November 10th. Did I pronounce that right? Franzoli. Franzoli is how you pronounce it. That's exactly it. All right. Now, what what is Franzoli? Do you mind me asking? Uh, Franzoli is an unnecessary amount of decoration. Um, yeah, something unnecessary added as decoration. So I, I found it on the old dictionary.com of all places. I'm a cheat. That's that's basically it. So, yeah. <laughs> or, were, it, <laughs> were you just searching for some sort of random word for the album? Yeah, Is that how there you it was. It? It, was wor- it was word of the day. So it was just slapping me in the face. But no, I think I was r- writing some lyrics and I was like, oh, what does that mean? I can't remember what it was. But then um, at the time, this word yeah, just came up. And I think as everyone always asks me why you called the psychedelic porn crumpets, I can now just be like Franzoli. And I think, yeah, for one word, definition um it seemed to sum up a lot of us as people and the band and where we were heading so i was like all right wicked there's the album name um so it just yeah just rounded it off nicely okay so franzoli you just you ran across that word it struck you somehow and you just said yep let's run with it yeah uh, that's pretty simple as yeah that is it and you know we'll dig into it really quick the front cover it looks like (laughs) an older woman either playing a kazoo or having a vape what is it? It is a cigar. Yeah, no. So that was uh, a photo at my wedding. So that was in March this year. Um, and so that lady is Anne, um, Anne Cummins. I think that's her last name. It would be Anne Cummins. Yeah. So, and okay. she is, or Anne Toomey. It'd be one of the two. Anyway, it's my wife's Anne. <laughs> you better get that so, name yeah. down quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's what I'm like, shit, we're family now. Yeah. <laughs> Like, so would that be my nan-in-law? Yeah, I think it would I think be. so, yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, she doesn't usually smoke. She's the sweetest old lady. And um, 
someone had brought back some like stogies for the for the wedding and so it was like she was lighting it up for someone my friend who was a photographer just managed to snap this picture and we were like oh and we were kind of joking about using it for the album cover and we we're like oh man because all the other ones are so safe we've got this like i don't know a bit more trippy artwork and more of like a palette for colors but now this was like oh this is like raw if we're going with it and it kind of works so <laughs> i'm stoked with it <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, look, I've I've ordered mine. I've got my. In fact, I got the Australia oh, really? Post um, signal today Legend. that it's on its way. So, oh, so we would have we would have sent spent last Tuesday shipping them all out. So we've personally did them. Oh, okay. So I, I'm very curious about the record label and how you run it. It's called What Reality Records. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. All right. So you guys have warehouse slash someone's garage that you store all this stuff in, and then. A lot of you just come in when it's album shipping day. You guys just come in and just make it all happen. An assembly That's, line. Yeah, it's pretty much it. Yeah, we got the old sweatshop going, the old Perth sweatshop, so that, yeah, <laughs> the band has two uses. But <laughs> no, I think we're at Rish's house. So he lives in the hills. It's about a 40-minute drive from, well, if you if you know Perth, he lives in Kalamunda. Mm. Um it's beautiful. So it's just like right on the edge of like the national park. And the, he's like sort of the edge of existence, but we've got everything out there. A um, bunch of boxes of mailers and tapes and vinyl records. And yeah, so we've just tried to sign as much as possible. And I suppose once you've got that like one-on-one -on -one communication with the person who's bought it, like it feels a lot nicer. It's like we wrote the record in a home studio. We're shipping it out of one of the people's, houses and it's going to get to your door from from us straight to you with no middleman really so it's it's pretty much as as a home job as it comes hopefully now are are you worried a little bit about the scale at one point getting out of hand because look with if if you keep working at it your fan base is going to grow and grow and pretty soon you're going to be at a situation where it's not just a a five band member job you're going to have to get others involved uh I think that would be a great problem to worry about, really, wouldn't it? It would be like, if we were if we were at that stage, then yes. But now it's like, I suppose we've got just enough, like we have distributors in America and we've got distributors in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do the, the Australian store. So it seems to have, like, obviously when it's album release day, that's the busiest we're going to be. Um, but then when it comes to maybe just a couple of days or weeks after that, when it's a bit slower, then we'll spend maybe a day's work, shipping everything out. So it seems to be pretty manageable at the moment, which is nice. And so we can write okay. stuff and I don't know, <laughs> write, yeah, draw someone's face on someone's record when they haven't asked for it. But <laughs> I love no, I that. Don't. I love that. Whenever I, when I go see a band, you know, you know especially a, a, a small band who's, who's made their own records, who's taken the time to invest in records, I, I want to buy one of your records, but but do me a favor, just doodle on it, right? Just have yeah, yeah, fun yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah. it. It seems more of a personal touch, so hopefully we've done that. Or we're going to get a bunch of complaints and be like, oh, what have you done? Because <laughs> like, we've actually drawn, yeah, on the record itself. No, we haven't done that. So uh, with this record, I think you've got, is it 250 copies for the first Australian press? Is that, do I have my numbers right on that? Um. Yeah, I think, it, well, it was 500 for the first Australian okay. press. So that's, I think, what we sold okay. on Bandcamp. 250 are signed and 250 aren't. That I'm was sure. how it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Now, where do you get the records pressed? So this was from Zenith. So we did them with the Melbourne company for the Australian ones. And they had, um, I haven't seen it before, but they did the recycled records. So every variant is, like, unique and different. Because um, we've done, how many records have we done so far? Like five. This would be our sixth. We've done all these different splatter variations and rainbow and swells and things. And I think it was like, what can we do that's sort of going to be a bit different from any previous one? And the recycle ones, like if they get two different records, they look sick. Like some of the ones, I think we had like four or five different um, examples, which when we, we didn't want to take them all out of the sleeves. Like, so when we did, we were like, wow, they, they look, they look great. Uh, and I think in Europe, we work with X Final X and America, was a different plant. So actually it might be all through X Final X. I think we get them shipped. So it would be one of the ones from Czech Republic, I think. Is okay. the big one. CZ or yeah. whatever. 
Yeah. Yeah, it'll be someone like that. Okay. Like, and then they'll be sh- shipped to America. But I mean, if we can find local distributors who are good, like, I don't know, good final distributors as well, like, all, all is. Mm-hmm. So you guys have, are very hands on, like picking the colors, picking the plants, putting that all yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you're uh, you're 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 quite a bit younger than me. Not nearly as much gray hair. Um, I was around. Vinyl was the preferred format when when I was uh, much uh, much younger. Um, you seem to have missed that, but caught the revival. And the interesting thing is, is you seem to really know how to put together a record package. It was it, it, were records kind of in your youth. Um, thank you for that. I think we've got like, I don't know, there's some where I'm like, man, we're so behind the ball on uh, when you do look at like Radiohead packaging or and I did just design as well. I'd love to be able to afford to get like those little secret slips and you've got this different like GSM sort of stock okay. in there with it. Some, Let me you know stop I mean? you right you there. Re- you try not to compare yourself to Radiohead so early. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Do they ship them out of their bedroom? I don't know. They might like. There's Tom York just licking stamps. Like, but yeah. Um, no, I think, yeah, like my dad's always had a record player. And when we were young, that, I think that's how it all starts, isn't it? Your dad, dad's hand me downs and you learning to break his stylus four or five times a week. Like, yeah. But no, it, with Rich is definitely the one who was more of a collector. I think when we first started making music, I was like, again, okay, like the dream would be to have your record pressed onto wax like i think that's every musician's pretty much dream that's the ultimate sort of um packaging and you can hold it you can smell it and you can play it and it's sort of i don't know it just feels like that's music so when we are sort of writing records that's the goal it's like you got an a side and you got a b side mm. if it's too long it's like you almost have to have four breaks so i think we've sort of like got to the point of how long a record is is determined because of the vinyl length so um we sort of seem to stick around that f- like 35 40 minute mark um when i know a lot of people as well like they're like why don't you release a longer record and you can i suppose but uh i don't know i kind of just like that a side b side sweet there's always that sort of break yeah. and it's always aimed at being on vinyl so yeah it's it's definitely the preferred medium of us i i kind of think there's something in the human psyche that requires that that break, that reset after about 20 minutes where you got to get up, you yeah. got to flip the record and then you're able to kind of get know, back on, get yeah. back on. That's right. Yeah. So you didn't come necessarily from a record collecting background or did you have a collection? Was it, was it interesting? When did you find yourself interested in, in records? Oh man. Like it was pretty much when I was doing design, I think. And I was like, how, I mean, CDs were almost dead even when we started to collect them. Do you know what I mean? I was de- I definitely have a bunch in the car and then cars eventually didn't have CD players anymore. So even they don't make computers with CD players anymore. So you're <laughs> just like, what? Like, If you wanted to put all your music somewhere, it's sort of just now back to the shelves. So, um, which is cool. But I myself have been much more of the branding sort of like, I liked the design of it. Like I liked the cover. I like if you put anything on a cover, it became artwork. Like, and that's sort of as well having our, my nan as the album cover smoking the cigar. It's like, that is art now. It's like, it's cool. It's funny. It's interesting. And it's just different. I think the record collection that I've got is way too small for uh, someone that owns a record label. But I think that's because I'm trying to make them half the time. I'm also that person that gets kicked out of a record shop because they're like, are you going to buy it? And I'm like, oh, I just want to look at the gatefold, man. Like, let me have it. Like, what have they got in here? So, yeah, it's almost like I'm, I'm, I'm one of those. I'm a, I'm a looker and a, a yeah, mm-hmm. rather than I'll take it home and play it. I think it's the, I, I like the look of the wax. And then if it, if I do play it, like I'll play it. I don't know. I could only play it once or twice before it's like movies where, Maybe my record collection is too small. I just need bigger records, so it takes like every year to okay. get back to that 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 style. And I feel like as well, it's harder for me to have. I like making heavy music, and I like making softer music. But I feel like if I say it, no one's going to buy a porn conference records. But I, I like having a bit slower music in. I suppose that's everyone's like where you've got your record player. Do you know what I mean? Determines what kind of music you do listen to. 
So if the record was out out in the garage with a pool table, then Black Sabbath all day long. But now it's like it's in the lounge room with a bunch of pop plants around it. So it's probably going to be a bit more Andy Shaw flat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So where is your record player? In the lounge, yeah, rat surrounded by pop plants. So okay. I, I'm now moving it into the garage for the pool table. There you go. Yeah. Or you get a second one. Look, Black Sabbath goes with pot plants too, you know. Yeah. So I, I kind of think, and I've, you know, I, I moved to Australia about 20 years ago, and I, I, I'm so proud to be here, especially at this time, because I, I really feel that this is another golden age of Australian music. There's, a lot of phenomenal bands coming out. I mean, I put your band in there as well. Million. But, you know, oh, we're talking, you. you know, King Gizzard and uh, Amel and Tame the Chats. Pond. And yeah, I There's know. A, a ton of great bands. Coffin, great bands coming out of Australia right now. Australia's not an easy place to escape from, you know, to get your music out there. And Perth is even one degree <laughs> further away. Yeah, so, it's a bit bit difficult <laughs> yeah what when you started playing uh when, when you when you formed the band what was the aspiration for it yeah see that good question because that one is always changing do you know what i mean so when we were first a band and we were playing on thursday night to nobody the aspiration was to be able to have a saturday night gig do you know what i mean it was like just that we were like oh my god we're gonna play on a weekend like yeah like it's gonna be people there on a weekend so, and then I think it quickly sort of went from that to uh, you'd have a single launch or maybe you'd book somewhere and so you'd have the 200 cap room in Northbridge, like, and you were trying to sell that out or get some, get your friends down. And then you've made a shirt that you like, you love and the single's like live and you're sort of like, oh my God, like we've, we're, we're being part of something. And I think... It never really dawned on me that we would ever write an album. I think that was just like something the good bands do or the big bands. And like, it was almost, unf yeah, you couldn't comprehend that anyone would just listen to this small band from Perth if they weren't in Perth. And then we started getting hit up on like social media and they're like, oh, I've been listening to this from blah, blah, blah country and whatever in America. And yeah, our SoundCloud was getting hit up by people and you're getting shared. Um, and I think then it was like, even more like i don't know not that we took notice of it but it definitely became this thing we're like okay like maybe we can back ourselves now to write an album and then it just was fun i think it was only fun like if we didn't it wasn't it's never felt like work and it's never felt like anything that we're like if we had a review it would hurt because i think we're not going for that it's literally just like this is music that we create. We created in a barn. We've put it onto a record and we're just stoked with that. And then the fans and the shows are almost a byproduct of that. Right. It's it's like, so, and I think that's a nice way to look at it rather than being like, uh, if, if, if you're trying to aim at other people and fans, then you're clinging on to something that isn't necessarily the thing that you've started in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you didn't start the band to make fans. You started the band to make music. So it's like, but then it's the good byproduct of yeah. it is having people that you can yeah. discuss things. You with. make the music that you want to make, and if people want to come along with you on that journey, then yeah. that's fantastic. So was there was there a, a, a holy shit moment where you thought, oh my god, this could actually, <laughs> we could actually do this for a living? Like what what, what was was there any sort of inflection point or something happened? The other man, we seem to get them like once a tour where maybe each album or something happens you're like oh okay like fuck this is real like i think when the first time was maybe when we went over to melbourne and we did um our first like headline tour and let alone there was like i think we played at the workers club and the tote like we did, did the classic venues for melbourne mm. um and we played with a band called mangle Wurzel, who was like jala and um it was her first band cozzy's first band um, and I think just even getting over there, you felt like, oh, man, I don't even know, just a king. You were like, we have come from Perth <laughs> and we've sailed over to the eastern boundaries of Australia to bring music. It was weird. And you're like, kind of going back. You weren't there necessarily for 
the Melbourne scene and the Melbourne crowds. You're there because you wanted to tell everyone back in Perth that you were like, oh my God, we went to Melbourne. We're like, we played all these shows. And to them, they're imagining like these grand halls and everyone's dressed up like weirdly. And it's like, because it's Melbourne, there's 10,000 people in a room. But really, you're like playing at 12 o'clock in the back of a bar, like, and they got a bouncy castle outside or something. Yeah, it's just like, it's never as glamorous as it is when you're doing it, but yeah. it, for us, it was like, wow, like we can do it. And we only ever wanted to go back, not because we wanted to tell everyone in Perth, but, but it was like, then we were like, okay, what if everyone in Melbourne enjoyed it this time around? And what if everyone did this? And to the point now where I think like, we all did a gig. We've done a, the last couple of tours, like completely sober, just because we've sort of crossed that boundary of like, if we keep going on stage drunk and not playing the songs of how they're intended to be, like it's going to get pretty tedious for everyone else listening. Like it's not for us anymore. And I think that took, that was a big sort of holy shit moment. Like if we do it right, that's a job. And I think all of us sort of didn't never really thought it could be a job. So you're always like, ah, oh, like now, nah, like it's just a bunch of fun. Like we're going to have a beer with our mates and it's Saturday night. Like, let's do it. And then I think as we started touring more around Europe and America and Saturday night was every night, then you're like, okay, right. Not only do we have to kind of look after ourselves for health health benefits, but like we could actually do this. Like this could actually be a career. And I think we're now getting to that stage where it's like, all right, like we're coming home when we used to pay ourselves a Mars bar or like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's like okay, cool. Like you actually made a bit of money to afford some rent and some, or to write the next record. Yeah. So that, when we could make enough money off our own back without a label doing this Fronzoli one, and we funded enough to be like, cool, we have literally the budget that we set for Fronzoli again to write another record. That was a big holy shit moment. Mm. Like, oh my God, like, okay, well, we, can, we can actually make something here. So, so do you have all the equipment? Do you record it in your own studio? Is it all yeah, kind of band Yeah, it's, it's pretty much where you were coming from at the moment. It's, <laughs> I wish I, I should really set up the computer that way so you can look back, but it's, it's not huge. I need to, everyone who comes here is like, you doing all that? Like, yeah, like I should actually uh, probably get some new gear. But I think setting yourselves limitations as well. I don't know. I, Constraints are fantastic. Can, I mean, I think look, yeah. the, the first dozen King Gizzard albums were on an eight track. Yeah. And then was it Stu did, was talking to someone about how he records with an iPhone now? I was like, yeah. fuck off. <laughs> Man, like, yeah. How? Yeah. It's mad. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't need huge investments these days to to be able to make that happen but you do need skills you do need to be able to develop you know the ability to mic something so where it, it comes through it's recorded well and to be able to mix is that something you've had to kind of work through and uh, evolve your skill set yeah through? still 100 percent working on that like i am the amalgamation of bad techniques and i think you can they're just littered with it like the record so um I think I went from like band mentality to playing live was sort of the only thing I really was focused on to when I started recording properly. It's now like, all right, like I think my heroes went from like Kirk Cobain and Hendrix and Ozzy to like being Rick Rubin and to, um, I don't know who, I'm, I'm lost for words now, but like um, old Friedman, he did MGMT and he did Tame stuff. Um, Jeff Emmerich. Who, the, yeah, yeah that Jeff Emmerich, another great producer. But I think it's that I watch studio gear now and I try and go like, oh, how do I emulate this? How do I emulate that? When I probably am years behind where if I, I kind of get caught up with that. Like if we went and recorded with a studio engineer and we did the songs of what we did live, it would probably sound a lot better. But it's almost like now you can sort of follow the progression of Porn Crumpet's weirdly because you're like all right this is when jack thought he knew what he was doing <laughs> so like maybe in 10 albums time you'd be like all right it's starting to sound right and in the middle there you're like okay i can see where he's got this and done this and whatever but it's starting to sound a bit cleaner i think hopefully it's getting to that point where like the things i am recording i don't have to cake as much in distortion or reverb or okay. hide it so going back to high visceral um yeah. the first album the first official album from porn Crumpets. yeah yeah yeah. now um that was part one there was a part two that was released the next year those have been out of print for quite some time 
Yeah. Any thoughts about bringing those back or are you thinking about doing any remixes or anything like that to perhaps um, uh, <laughs> correct history? Uh, yeah, mate, a hundred percent. Like I think we would do, well, there was this thing the other day, what was it? Someone was like, you've been a band since 2014. I think I started recording in 2014. I think we released High Visceral in 2016. So I've almost been doing, at that time, it would be like more time doing poor crumpets than I was at school, which is weird. Like, so it got to go as a 10 year anniversary. I, I think eventually we'll have the whole B sides in it, part one and part two. But we should definitely do part one as a self release as well. I think we did some for the shows in America, um, but there was just a, like a small run to sell at shows. But yeah, I mean, going back to what we were talking about before with the packaging it well, I would like to do some sort of like it, it's almost like a book. There's more to it. Like, I don't like the idea of repressing something and it's just a black record in a single sleeve and there's no gatefold. It's like, if we've already done it as that, then don't make the product less involved. Like, I'd like it to sort of get better. Do you know what I mean? Oh, of course. Like, have you have you done yeah. any just pure black records? I think all Porn Crumpets records have some sort of no, color in them. I don't think, yeah, I don't think we've ever done a black record. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> it's, just, it's just boring. Yeah. Yeah. So you started uh, uh, High Visceral, Parts 1 and 2 were on Rhubarb Records. Who was Rhubarb Records? We'll be back after these messages. Well, hey there, record collectors. There's a new service available that specializes in record cleaning, restoring, sticker removal, and professional grading. VMGVinyl.com VMG Vinyl can help you make the most of your collectible records. From professional cleaning of records and sleeves, removing old price tags and store stickers, dry cleaning and rejuvenation of old shrink wrap to make it look like new, even providing you a professional play-tested third-party grade with either removal grading or encasing in plastic you have a wide range of choices at vmgvinyl.com buying a highly collectible record and you want it checked out by an expert vmg vinyl can do that too head over there now and see what vmgvinyl.com can do for you and your collection that's vmgvinyl.com the one-stop shop for professional third-party grading cleaning and record restoration that's vmgvinyl.com Oh, and hey, record nerds, don't forget to clean your records with the very best and safest record cleaner, the Groove Washer. Make your records look and sound their very best and store them with confidence using the new Groove Washer Groove Guard record sleeves. You gotta try this out. It makes a huge difference to the quality of your vinyl experience. Ask for the Groove Washer by name at your local record store and accept no substitutes. Or head over to GrooveWasher.com and use discount code VINYLGUIDE. 10. All hail the Groove Washer. That's GrooveWasher.com, discount code VINYLGUIDE10. Now we return to the program, already in progress. No limits. No excuse. So, High Visceral, Parts 1 and 2 were on Rhubarb Records. Who was Rhubarb Records? So, Rhubarb was um, Dylan Sainsbury. So, he came to us, he worked at a place, yeah, Rhubarb Records. Like, it was the, pretty much one of the vinyl shops are one of the only vinyl shops sort of where around where we lived and he came down to a couple of shows um and we were very start like early days i think we just released high visceral and maybe a week later he was like do you want to have it pressed to record and like obviously we just jumped on it we're like yeah like hell yeah like that sounds amazing so he sort of got us into the record game i think he was like all right this is a record store, boys. Like, here's where you, <laughs> we sell records. Like, and we're going to do your one. And we're gonna, it's going to be on the shelf. And he pressed, I think we pressed 250 part ones. Um, and he was really just such a kind human. He didn't go like, here's any contracts. Like, here's basically, we're going to do 250 records. And if you guys press 250 records later on, you'll make this amount of money. And it was, we were like, oh, what? Like, he was like, yeah, like there's people who will buy these records. And so he sort of showed us the entire record business. Um, and that's pretty much what we got up to until we signed a deal with Marathon on this after part two. So he showed us part one, he pressed part one. We did part two ourselves. 
I think it got to part two when we were trying to record the third album. We were like, ah, oh, we're going to need to sell like a lot more records if we're trying to sort of progress. So mm-hmm. that's where the record label sort of helped. They got, they funded us for touring. We were ma- managed to release like a lot of records and they were just, they were really good. Marathon were great. They asked us, what do we want? And we'll stay out your ears. They didn't pick any singles and they weren't really like interested in changing the music. They were like, cool. Like, we're happy with you, what you're doing. Um, and I know they wanted to do Franzoli as um, doing another deal. And I think it was a couple album deal. Um, but I think we just at the time where we were like, man, we need to like go back to that ethos of what we had, which Dylan showed us and being like, okay, like hopefully big enough now where if we ship them ourselves and do everything ourselves, then we can like actually give this a really good crack of being probably independent, probably self-releasing, self-releasing music and just, um setting up the groundwork for hopefully signing other bands eventually so Mm. not to make money either to be what dylan showed us it would literally be like here if you do this we can do that and at least it's just a sort of a hub rather than a money making thing now you've actually started to sign other bands people taking pictures is that another that's rich's that's rich yeah so he's uh well he but his band is he's good so I think that's, we just wanted to give ourselves a platform to release music ourselves. And I'm about to do another project with Alex from Great Gable called Yellows. So like, we'll get, I'm pretty, I'm nearly finished that record. I mean, the record is finished. I just keep, when I say I'm nearly finished, I'm just writing more music until someone just goes like, there's your way over deadline. But I suppose because you can't tell yourself you're way over deadline. So um, it was sort of like, as I was writing from Zoli, this, whatever was, sort of acoustic would go into this other project. And I found that a lot easier now. If I write, instead of not writing something, I would just be like, well, that might work in a different project. And so mm-hmm. I can still finish it and it sounds, um, I don't know, it just gives me the freedom to be able to write rather than scrapping things. Right. So I don't know if you keep up on the record collectibles market. Are you familiar with what some of those early rhubarb pressings go for these days? Someone had shown me something ages ago, but no. I like, no. Are you talking about discogs and stuff? There's discogs. There's other secondary kind of markets of where you can get these records. But uh, Shamefully, shamefully, no, I should keep up more with it. Oh, yeah. Well, you you may be embarrassed (laughs) by it. You know, some of these records, your early records, going for four and five hundred dollars. Each, you know, I mean, that's, yeah, that's hectic. That's they're hectic. they're very hard to get. That's the thing, and which is you know, like when I went up there, to, I I discovered your band about it uh, when uh, the Night Gnomes came out, and I was like, yeah. oh my god, I got to get everything these guys do. But there were only a few of them that were still in print, and I still oh, are looking sure. for other ones. So that's why I'm, I'm I'm personally interested in high visceral parts one and two reissues. Okay. Well, we will definitely be, we will definitely be doing them again. Good. Like, um, yeah, for sure. Good. Yeah. How how <laughs> how did those sell initially? Were they on your? Were you selling them at live shows? Were they? I imagine they were in the rhubarb shop. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I think they would. They we must have put some on Bandcamp. I think, mm. um, and we would have put some. I think we we did an album launch and we sold probably a fair few of them. So I'd say Perth is where the majority of them are. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, there was, there's someone who came to a show in America and they had an OG, like rhubarb one pressing. And I was like, fuck. And it was the orange one. Like, I, the band don't even have them. They were like, I think I, uh, I gave one to my brother. So he'll have one. Tell him it's worth a hundred bucks and it would bite your arm off for it. So <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, look, if you find a box in there somewhere in, in the Rich's garage oh. or anything, you're uh... <laughs> Yeah, dude, that'd be, that'd be funny. <laughs> Very good. So so uh, there seems to be a lot of really interesting inertia around psychedelic porn crumpets. And, and I wanted to ask you about the name because obviously it's a very unconventional name. Was there a name prior to psychedelic porn crumpets or was that kind of it from day one? No, it was just, it. so it started as a branding unit at, um at uni where they would just gave us free reign to sort of design something it was one of those introductory units where they're just like hey you're being a graphic designer for a day choose something brand it show us and blah 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 and i think at the time i just got into unknown more orchestra and king gizzard and pond and tame 
So this would have been like 2014, maybe. Um, uh, and I think like I just thought psychedelic porn was <laughs> hilarious. That was it. It was nothing. It was never meant to be a band. Um, and my lecturer just asked like, oh, like, do you write music? I was like, oh yeah. Like he was like, um, and I, at the time I was like doing like hip hop stuff like on a machine and I'd played in bands. I was playing bass and I was, um, I'd played guitar previously in other projects, but never sang or never done anything like that. So I sort of was like, all right, I'll write some music. So I did Cornflake, Marmalade Marching, Cubensis, Lenses. So, so I was like, that'll theme, that'll fit the theme. <laughs> Uh, and then I really enjoyed doing it that I was like, oh, fuck, like, why am I doing design? I kind of want to do music now. Mm -hmm. And I was always recording in Ableton, but it sort of became, I don't know, almost like a performance art thing where I was like, oh, well, I'm not this person, uh, but I'll, I'll live the brand. I'll live the thing. I'll do, I'll be the porn crumpets front man kind of thing. And then it changed after a couple of albums where I was like, oh my God, I need to be like myself. But myself became it so much that now I'm like, what the fuck's going on? It's like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I should have a suit and tie and go and work somewhere, corporate world, but sort of just became Jack from Porn Crumpets. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. that's a hard one to work. Yeah, you can't work with children after being in the band name. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, yeah. a, little, a little hard <laughs> to get one of those working with check. Uh, yeah. Work, working <laughs> yeah, with children yeah. checks, yeah. Um, yeah, so it was definitely a strong move. So has the name, I guess, because even developing this episode, I'm thinking like, okay, am, is Google going to do something weird with my algorithm if I'm publishing something porn, something or other? Probably. Like, yeah. <laughs> like what, what sort of stories, what kind of experience, what kind of guidance would you give me in terms of, of, of how to I would it? say go mate build a time machine and just we shouldn't have done this interview that was basically it your channel is now forever blacklisted no i i think i don't know it definitely has affected us through social media like there is no people are like typing it i think they've come up with psychedelic popcorn crumpets is like if you type that in you can get everything so that seems to be we should really change our name to that but um it's just kind of funny i suppose when we're doing shows as well it's really word of mouth and i think that sort of is a testament as well to like the mm -hmm. work and the records and it's almost like if people want to find it they do find it and it's not it's not a band you stumble across maybe on a spotify playlist or something but you don't get fed too much like it's definitely a word of mouth band which i kind of enjoy more so it's like yeah. I remember seeing Gareth Lydia talk about Tropical Fart Storm as well in the same way where it was like, there's no, I mean, he was in the drones and then changed it to Tropical Fart Storm. So it wasn't like it was called something previously and we went porn crumpets, but yeah, I'm, I'm almost, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a hard one. It's because it is what it is. I, I'd write, I'd do it. Yeah. I, what do you think? I, What's your take? I would anticipate, I, I, I would suggest it's, it's probably a benefit and here's why. And uh, now I just had, you know, the band Pigs, 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 Pigs. Pigs 7. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But like someone told me they, they were recommending a bunch of bands, probably three or four different bands. And Pigs, 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 Pigs was one of them. Right. And yeah, that's yeah, yeah. the one I remembered. And that's the yeah. one I went and I looked for. And I think the same happened with Psychedelic Porn Crumpets. It's like, okay, well, I'm not going to forget that name. And so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went and that's, I think that's how I kind of stumbled on the, you know, I got on the trail, right? I got on the scent oh, yes, that yeah. way. So I, I think it, it's it's good for introducing people to it. I think it's just uh, probably an artifact. Yeah, very much like Tropical Fuckstorm. You know, people who are offended by yeah. it probably aren't going to be the market you want to reach in. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. You've already, you've already... To, like narrowed it down to your listener. If, if you like the sound of the band name, you're probably going to enjoy the music. Yeah, exactly. And it's very self descriptive Well, not the porn crumpets bit. They're very psychedelic, <laughs> I, I would say. But I would imagine That's the bit I don't I, like. I, I would imagine you'd probably also get some editing of it, especially in the U.S. My my former country. I know that when you play certain areas, you probably can't advertise it as freely as. Others, yeah, yeah I, that's why I think it is word of mouth. And it probably just gives our um, booking agent an absolute migraine every time he's like, who have you booked? Oh, God. All right, okay. Like, this is going to be a hard sell. But the shows in America have been, strangely enough, that's our number one market now. Like, is it? apart from maybe Netherlands. Like, yeah, like, um, 
I, sp- I think it's to do with anywhere that legalized weed, we seem to just absolutely thrive. So uh, it seems to have a people, I don't know, like Colorado and Amsterdam, two major cities where we have just, I don't know, that's it. And I suppose they're still big music communities, mm-hmm. but they're not the biggest cities in the world. So, But them two are just like, yeah, can't get enough. It, it's great. Like I'll jump on board with it. Oh, well, Oregon just legalized mushrooms. So maybe there's a market there. Did they? Yes. Oh, my God. There you yeah. go. Fucking hell, how do you legalize mushrooms? <laughs> well, how are you going to stop it is probably the better question. It's like, it's, it's, yeah, they, they might as well true. just accept it and tax it. <laughs> that's the. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I hope Australia comes around one day. Um, mushrooms, oh, too. That'd be, that'd, be, that'd be fun. That'll be very interesting. <laughs> so you spend a lot of time in the U.S. Now, the levitation sessions, how do those work? Do you, you have to get invited to the levitation sessions? How, how does that come together? Yeah, so they actually hit us up asking if we could do, I think at the time that was like a COVID sort of um, session they were doing. I think they've done them previously, but obviously in COVID, like that absolutely, everyone wanted to watch someone being outdoors in a band sort Mm -hmm. of playing. So a really great idea. Um, And we became friends with Harry because he was managing, I think it was Frankie and the Witch Fingers. And we did our first tour of America and they supported us. Um, so sort of always kept in contact with Harry and then he hit us up because we were going to do a press in for Fonzoli with um, Levitation. Um, and I feel like that session we gave, we were on to an absolute winner. We went down to this place. Like our album was called Night Gnomes. We recorded all this music and we went to this place called Gnomesville down in um, just like near Bridgetown, like sort of south of Perth, maybe a three hour drive. Um, and we set everything up, spent the whole day setting up our lights, visuals, uh, Tay and the cameraman. It was like getting cold. We're like, all right, we're going to start. And some, we're about two songs in and an angry neighbor came down. It was like, I'm going to fucking run you over my bobcat if you don't piss off. <laughs> we were like, no way. And he was like, I'm coming back. Like, I will absolutely flatten your gear. And we were like, okay, this guy is mean. Like he had a big old chopper handlebar, like mustache shaved head and you don't you don't you don't fuck around with those sort of dogs three hours south of perth like yeah okay he will come down in his bobcat so we had to pack up um and it was sort of this rust job of finding another location and doing it quickly when everyone was free and we we did it my parents had this little property like so they just had some grass patch we did it opposite the lake and it was such a rush job that it didn't i don't think any of us were very happy with it Harry liked it, which we were pleased with, but it was t- for the one live session to go to a record, being that we were like, no, it was heartbreaking because obviously we the the real one we should have been before, so it was sort of this sort of ah, not, yeah, it was a bit heartbreaking. So now I'm like, all right, we need to do a new one. So I'm always in Harry's ear, like next time, like, can we do a new one? Can we do another one? Can we do another one? So mm-hmm. hopefully we'll do another one soon. Now I've noticed there's no Australian release for that. Is that why you? You're, you're hoping for a, a a second chance at it? No, I think he just did. He uh, did any of the other ones have an Australian release? The Levitation Sessions? I, I think, think so, I think some of them sessions. did. I think I'm, yeah, okay. boss from bought some from Strange World. I think I don't know. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. No, I think they just maybe uh, he was just selling them in New York where they're based. Okay, for Greenway Greenway Records. So, mm. Yeah, that's. Um, but no, I. I would love to do an Australian live session. I think that would be sick. And now we know like um, that we could actually do a couple on ourselves with maybe Zenith. And yeah, cause it's hard. Like ev- everyone has a very uh, different story about Perth record manufacturers. So it was like for ages, everyone was like, oh, you have to go over to Europe. You have to do this. And like, we're like, we got a test press and we're like, that's sick. Like, that sounds amazing. It's like, what is pressed in Melbourne? Like, uh, and now they're getting a very good reputation. So Zenith is beautiful. Almost, they're the they're one yeah. of the certainly one of the best plants in Australia, if not beyond. Um, yeah, and beautiful art as well. Yeah, man, the stock that we're, we're like, wow, this is sick. This is way better than European stuff. <laughs> like, okay, like what have we been doing for five years? Have you ever gotten a record that you know once it's come back to you, you guys were disappointed either color wise or sound wise or? Oh yeah, no, that happened a lot. Like we definitely had. Um, a few maybe tour represses that were 
not not necessarily the ones that we've decided to put into stores and um do like actually release like that we've always sort of if it was bad would send it back do you know what i mean it would be like would work out like okay no one's paid for that like and they're not going to pay for it because it's flimsy. It's going to snap before they hold it. So, um, like, definitely we've sort of tried to have, like, a really good rapport with fans and so that they get good quality records. Um, but there was one where we did a repress. I think it was of a high visceral. And that was for maybe a European tour. We only did, like, 100 or maybe 200. But they were literally like frisbees, and I think that's where it came from. The term we were just like that is like nah. So we would just started calling records frisbees from then on, right. <laughs> which uh, yeah. But never again. Now it's like quality over yeah. quantity. Like oh. I think that's always the yeah. After getting stung, and then they're not cheap to produce as well. So you kind of take a ten grand hit if they aren't if they're not good. So now we sort of really try and work well with the distributor as well. Yeah. And and again with Close. Zenith, you kind of you know you, you you keep the money a little bit more in the community. Uh, yeah, it stays in country. You feel a little bit better doing it through an organization. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. Yeah. Now I've noticed that um, some of the releases have had a few extras there, and I think my copy of Shiga came with rolling papers. I want to say. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. What what other things? What other kind of uh, interesting thing? What's the strangest thing you ever put on the merch table? Oh my god! Um, <laughs> no, I can't remember. Like, we've done merch has only become this thing recently where we've sort of paid more attention to it. Like, because it was this sort of two way street where you're like, we're not in a shop, we make music. But then I suppose it was the more people kept coming up to us and like, why don't you have any of beanies or why don't you have any hats or why don't you have rolling papers or why don't you have like zippos and things? And, and now we're getting into more of these refractual gr- glasses and trying to actually think like what people want and need when they are at the show or what they would wear or use afterwards. And you don't want to seem like you're milking it. I've always hated that. I've always been like, look, like I'm, I'm someone that doesn't even want to post on like social mm. media that we're doing a record. Like I'm like, nah, let people find out. It's way more fun. Do you know what I mean? If they're like, what, they released a record? Oh shit, I got to go and find it. And you're like, it's, I don't know. I, I I sort of think word of mouth rather than social media all day long. But then our manager will just be like, you're not going to make any money. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Mate, Which we, I need, suppose, we need petrol to get to the next town. <laughs> yeah, literally. And I think because that's not been a high priority of mine that I probably is good. I'm not managing the band. But um, no, I, I usually like asking people at shows like, what do you, what would you wear? What do you want? What do you like? What should we work with? And um, hitting up a designer as well, if they've got some ideas, like tends to be the go, but, it's hard, like not. It's hard coming up with something completely unique for merch. But we've been putting our brains together for a while, talking about doing um, little tab books and photography stuff. Because all the boys are always, we've always got cameras or doing bits and pieces. So trying to involve that, and also trying to make it more hands on. Like we wanted to take a tattoo artist with us for the last couple of tours, and do throwies because he was down the bowls club where I was drinking. And I was just going up every time I was getting a pint. I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll get another one. Uh, and it was it was fun. And there was even like 50, like 60-year-old women who don't even have a tattoo and usually talk badly about them. Uh, and they were like next in the chair. Like they were like getting a bowling ball or something. <laughs> and so we were like, imagine, imagine having a tattoo artist that shows who was just doing little designs and it was only going to take you four or five minutes. But um I think I would love to go and see one of my favorite bands and be like, yeah, like I got a tat there too. It just, I don't know. <laughs> Might just say like, you're an idiot, but like, that's it. It's like, nah, I got it. Got it at a Giz concert. It'll be, it'll be great. Well, we look forward to that. Uh, you guys are touring. <laughs> uh, so Franzoli out November 10th, there's 500 copies of the first press. And um, I think there's some left. What reality records.bandcamp.com people listening you'd be a damn fool not to run up there and just grab one while you still can what was interesting about that i saw is the first thing that sold out on the franzoli was the cassette was it the cassettes are all they, gone oh no way yeah they, they actually look really smart like i saw we, we were shipping them out and i was like oh and i was like oh can we like have we got enough to give to each other and we're like man like we yeah they did they all went um i think we put aside like maybe 20 copies of the record um 
just for damages and stuff. Yeah. Like, so they but um, we kind of fucked up as well because we don't have any to release on release day. So we're like, okay, like we should probably repress that quick. And I didn't think we would sell that many in Australia too. So it was nice um, actually being able to have people sort of like pre-order records. Mm-hmm. I suppose that was, um, I don't know. We've never done that properly before. We had a big campaign for a pre-order. So it, it was, yeah, it sort of set the ball rolling. And now, all right, release day, November 10th, we'll see. Hopefully, I think a lot of people wait to hear the album as well before they buy the record. But um, it's nice to know the fans have a bit of faith in us. But. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, and I don't think there was even really a big campaign. I think I, I heard about it somewhere i you know and and by the way i'm i'm prime target market i've bought records from there before i was i and i found out kind of via a third party <laughs> oh, which again i think goes to your desire for the band not to i guess overhype themselves so much but just to let the word yeah. get out and if you do something that's kind of a big bang that may bring in people who aren't exactly fans Right, you know, yeah. so this oh, way you know, the fans hear about it early, and and uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. So Jack, thank you so much for coming on the Vinyl Guide, mate. I gotta say, as a as a fellow countryman, I know I don't sound like one, but as a fellow <laughs> countryman, very very proud uh, of what you guys have been doing. Really enjoying the albums. I'm looking forward to Franzoli. Again, I recommend people check out psychedelicporncrumpets.com. There's uh, live dates there going up and down through Australia at the end of the year, as well as UK and Europe next year. I'm sure uh, some shows in the States will follow. So uh, make sure you grab a ticket if you're anywhere near there. And of course, right now go to whatrealityrecords.bandcamp.com and grab yourself a copy of Franzoli, uh, one of the first uh, presses, if you still can. Uh, and if you got a couple extra bucks, grab a grab an autograph one, and maybe Jack and the crew will scrawl something interesting on the <laughs> on the record there. Jack, thanks so much for coming on the Vinyl Guide, mate. Uh, thank you so much for having me on, Nate. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh man, what a lovely dude! And <laughs> what a fantastic band, psychedelic porn crumpets. I've yet to see them live. I was going to go see them oh, was about a year and a half ago, uh, right as the pandemic was starting to kind of wind down. And uh, the day before the show, I caught COVID and I wasn't able to go. I stayed home like a good citizen and I missed my chance at seeing psychedelic porn crumpets in a rather small place too. So I know I'm going to have to see them at a bigger spot next time. Again, psychedelicporncrumpets.com. And I strongly urge you to get a copy of First Aussie pressing of Franzoli. It's up there now. Psychedelicporncrumpets.bandcamp.com. I've got the link in this episode page. Grab one now or cry later. And that wraps up this episode of the Vinyl Guide. Thank you so much for downloading and tuning in. And especially to all you folks who are sharing these episodes on your social media. That is a huge help. You know what else? If you have a moment, please leave us a positive review on iTunes or Spotify. Say something nice. Rate us five out of five stars. That is always super appreciated. And we'll be back shortly with a brand new episode. So until we talk next time, get out there and buy some records, people. Cheers. Cheers.